two session two. It's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, but I hope you've enjoyed uh, each of the different sessions so far. This particular session is now looking at delivering youth talks. So we're kind of building on the foundation that Andrew set in session one. Uh, you've looked a little bit already at what that foundation looks like when it's built upon with regards to kids' talks and small groups. This one is now looking at youth talks. We've got some youth with us in the back row, so they can be our case study as to whether or not we got youth always go to the back row, aren't they? The rowies in the back. Um, so this is looking at youth talks. Now you're probably here because uh, to some degree as you think about delivering youth talks you find it uh, in some way daunting, right? And if you don't find it daunting in some respect then we should trade places and you should come up here because I think all of us find it in some way extremely daunting. And I was reminded recently as to how daunting giving youth talks can be. I was speaking to a pastor. Uh, this guy is someone who stands in front of his church regularly every single Sunday so he's got no problem public speaking. He has been a pastor for a good few years with the Bible College, so he's excellent at kind of dissecting the Bible, doing all those principles that Andrew shared with us in session one. He's great at that. Not just that, he's a superb preacher, right? Brilliant preacher. And he was being asked to speak at a youth event in a couple of weeks' time. Speak to a bunch of young people, Christian young people, and he was terrified, right? He was literally having sleepless nights at the thought of speaking uh, to a group of young people. And if you're anything like me, let me hear. Uh, that story and you hear of this pastor who is brilliant at speaking in front of people, who's brilliant at breaking down the Bible, who's a super preacher and you think even he's having sleepless nights at the thought of sharing the Bible with other people. <laughs> uh, I have great need to be afraid, don't we? Uh, when we think about our own roles and our own uh, abilities to share the Bible with, with young people and perhaps three reasons uh, we feel really daunted when it comes to delivering uh, youth talks or speaking to young people about the Bible. Reason number one is we feel totally disconnected from their world, don't we? We feel totally disconnected from their world. Uh, it seems totally alien to our world. Not only if you're like, you know, 50, 60, 70 years old, but even sometimes, if you're honest, even if you're 20, 30 year old, you in still in some way feel a little bit disconnected from a 12 year old, 13 year old, 14 year old, because the culture changes so quickly, things change so fast, and even you feel a little bit behind the game, don't you? So that's reason number one. You feel totally disconnected from the world. Reason number two, uh, that you maybe find the thought of delivering your talks about don't thing is because you feel this pressure to be funny or you feel the pressure to be entertaining, don't we? And we kind of think, well, if I want to give you a talk, it has to be really slick and funny and entertaining and everyone has to love it and really enjoy it and it has to be so seamless. And that, in some sense, makes us a little bit nervous about the thought of delivering your talks and things. I could never do that. Um, but perhaps the third reason uh, is that youth and young people are intimidating, aren't they? Young people are intimidated. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of walking down the street and having to walk through a group of young people. It's an intimidating thing, isn't it? The other day I, I did it when I was like primary school kids, and I was still kind of putting the head down, walking through <laughs> these primary school kids saying, Don't call me out, don't call me out. Young people are intimidating. And if you ever stood in front of a group of young people to deliver a talk, they all kind of start turning each other and laughing, and you kind of get self conscious going, What's going on? Have I said something weird? Young people are intimidating. They're intimidating. And so perhaps. Those three factors, or a combination of those three factors, or other factors that you want to add to the table, all kind of contribute to making the idea of delivering youth talks a little bit daunting for us. And so my hope in this really short seminar is to try and ease some of those fears to some degree, and to try and give us a little bit more confidence as we think about uh, sharing uh, the Bible and teaching the Bible uh, to young people. And I think off the bat there are two errors uh, that we need to avoid, two kind of equal but opposite errors they kind of contradict each other but probably there are two of the most common errors uh, that you see when you see young people or you see people communicate the bible to young people here's error number one believing that young people cannot handle the bible error number one believing that young people cannot handle the bible when you think about it logically young people today should theoretically have better bible knowledge than any generation of young people in the history of the Western world, don't think. Think about it, we have greater advancements in technology, we've got the ability to spread the news of the gospel uh, further, quicker, pretty much at the click of a button, easier than any other generation that's gone before us. Not only that, we've got an unbelievable plethora of resources at our fingertips, biblical resources through commentaries, uh, through sermons, articles, blogs, all these things. You don't have to go around your local library to read a book. You can get it all in a few minutes at your fingertips online. Add to that, we've now got youth ministry, which has been going in the church. It's relatively new, but about 60, 70 years. Youth ministry is now something which is really established. 
pretty much every church has some form of youth ministry. If not, they're attempting to have some form of youth ministry. Some churches even have youth pastors, employed youth workers. And so in theory, young people should have better Bible knowledge than any generation of young people in the history of the world. Did we know, don't we? Statistically, and even from our own experience, that that's not the case. In fact, young people today in the Western world are perhaps more biblically illiterate uh, than they've ever been in recent history. And what is the reason for that? Of course, there's a, probably a bunch of reasons that you can think of, but I believe one of them is this area, that we believe this myth that young people actually can't handle the Bible. And so our youth ministries and our youth work is totally entertainment driven and we fill all our youth ministries and all our youth activities with gimmicks and illustrations and stories and pizza uh, and actually we kind of sprinkle in God's word at the end and that actually kind of translates uh, into our Bible talks. Our Bible talks are filled with gimmicks, stories, uh, trying to be relevant, trying to be cool and we just kind of sprinkle the Bible in like a little bit of magic dust right at the end and hope that it'll do its work. And really what we're saying when we do that is we don't really believe uh, that God's word is profitable, that it can really teach and transform and shape everyone's life. It might work for older people, but it doesn't really work for younger people. And for some reason, we take those principles, those amazing principles that, that Andrew shared with us in session one, the nuts and bolts of exegeting the passage, and we think, that's brilliant for older people. <laughs> But for some reason we think uh, those rules kind of go out the window when it comes to teaching young people and that's just not the case. I've used this illustration before but um, a couple of years ago I watched a documentary, um, a nature documentary, okay, it's a secret thing that I do, watch nature documentaries, a bit of but uh, I was watching a doc documentary on Victoria Falls, right? It's a waterfall between Zambia and Zimbabwe and it's an unbelievable scene, it's an amazing waterfall and you see all these people gathered looking at this stunning piece of natural beauty and as you looked at that waterfall and as you looked at all the people gathered there were some things that you didn't see right you didn't see any hobby horses didn't see the big dipper didn't see any slot machines and the reason is you don't need those things why because Victoria Falls in and of itself is brilliant it's amazing but if you're to go uh, over Easter some of you probably will do up to the north coast you might go to the East Strand and Port Rush and it's pretty good isn't it but you kind of need Barry's, don't you? You kind of need, you kind of need the Big Dipper. You kind of need the, the hobby horses. You kind of need all those things because these strands quite nice, but it's not Victoria Falls, or it's not. It's not wow. And so many of us, if we're honest, maybe we wouldn't say this with our mouth, but our actions would convey this. So when we come to delivering a talk to young people, we kind of treat the Bible more like. Uh, the East Strand of Port Rush than we do in Victoria Falls. We think it's quite good, but I kind of need to spice it up. I kind of need to add these few things in. But what the principle, the Bible itself teaches us is no, the Bible is wow. The Bible is amazing because why? The principle that we see time and time again is this. Truth is what transforms. Truth transforms. Time and time again we see it's the truth of God's word that transforms. That doesn't just apply for a certain age category of people. That applies to every age category of people. It's the knowledge of God's truth is the thing that transforms them. It's not through hooking them in and entertaining them and beating the world at its own game. No, it's by informing and equipping them with the truth of God's word because it's knowledge of the truth which leads to transformation of the heart. And I've seen this principle I was reminded of this principle recently as I was reading Titus 1, verse 1. And Paul starts this letter to Titus. Look what he says. He draws this link between truth and godliness and knowledge and godliness in the very first verse. Here's how he begins the letter. He says, This letter is from Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I have been sent to proclaim faith to those God has chosen and to teach them to, notice the link, know truth that shows them how to live godly lives. See the link? Your knowledge of the truth leads to godliness. It's truth that transforms. And that is the most important thing that we can communicate as we stand before young people and aim to deliver a talk to them. They need to know that our sole and complete reliance is not on our humor. It's not on our ability to communicate. It's not on our ability to tell a good story. Our sole reliance is on God's word. Even if we stumble through it, even if we make a total hash of some of the stories we're going to tell, if they can see, one of the most effective things we can do is that they can see that our sole reliance is not on our gifts and abilities, but it's on uh, the truth, which can ultimately transform. Then we're off to an extremely, extremely good start. 
Um, because here's something that's comforting for me, and it might be comforting for you too. We don't need to make the Bible relevant. We don't need to make the Bible relevant. We can't make the Bible relevant. It just is relevant, isn't it? It just is relevant to the young person in your church, the young person that you'll encounter this summer, the 12-year-old, 13-year-old, I don't care what their background is. The Bible just is relevant to them. It is. And so your job isn't to make it relevant. Your job is to do the hard work and to showing them how it's relevant. And that's going to be difficult. Uh, but you're going to be able to do that um, as you do a little bit of work uh, and think about how you apply the text to them. But your job is to teach faithfully the Word of God. And perhaps the kickback that you get as you think about the idea of actually teaching the Bible to young people is this, won't it go over their heads? I mean, will my young people actually understand if I actually try and teach a passage to them, won't it go whoosh, way over their heads? And the answer is probably at some point it will. And so your job as someone who's communicating the scriptures, you have to first be accessible and then second be faithful as well. You have to be accessible and faithful. Accessible, speak in their language, speak in terms that they understand, but you've got to be faithful. Faithful to the text. There might be points where they actually don't understand, you lose them, but you, your job as a communicator is to give them avenues where they can jump back in and easily continue. Even if there's a little part they don't understand, give them a buy-in where they can come back in and follow along and still get the main emphasis, the main theme of your message. It needs to be accessible in their language, in their terms, but it needs to be faithful. And Andrew mentioned parables in session one. Isn't that exactly what Jesus did, the greatest communicator of truth ever to walk this earth? He spoke in a way that was accessible. He used parables, connecting with the everyday man in language they understood, using illustrations they would understand. But it was faithful, and actually he said things that people didn't understand, and actually that was almost the point, wasn't it? As Jesus communicated parables, you kind of hear the parable and you think, I don't actually really know what that means. And why did he do that? Because it's to draw you in a little bit further. To try and bring you in a little bit closer, a little bit closer, so that you dig a little bit deeper. Why? Because truth transforms. Truth uh, transforms. And so I would argue that this first error is a massive one. This error of believing that young people actually can't handle the Bible. And I would actually argue uh, that young people have a greater ability to understand the Bible than perhaps anyone else in your church. That's maybe controversial, isn't it? But as you think about your church gathering on a Sunday morning, think about the range of people that you have. Think of the range of ages that you have. It's the young people who are actually used to a learning environment, aren't they? The young people are the ones who are in school every single day. Everyone else, they're maybe builders or bankers or accountants or engineers. They've kind of been out of the zone of study for a long time. It's the young people who every day are sitting, absorbing information, studying textbooks. They are actually the ones who are best placed to learn and absorb information. That's reason number one. Reason number two. Well, as you look through the scriptures, isn't it young people that God continually delights to use in fulfilling his purposes? You just think about the big storyline of the Bible. Think how many times... God uses young people with Joseph, with David, with Samuel, with Daniel, with Timothy. Time and time again, God shows how he delights to use young people for great spiritual exploits. How they're capable of great spiritual exploits for God's kingdom. And nothing's changed, sure hasn't. In the life of young people, biologically, nothing's changed. They're still equally capable of great spiritual exploits. We need to avoid error number one, believing young people cannot handle the Bible. But the other error we need to avoid is perhaps the opposite error. I would argue perhaps not as big an error as the first one, but still one we want to try and avoid. It's the kind of opposite one. It's believing that we should approach teaching the Bible to young people in exactly the same way as adults. Believing we should approach teaching the Bible to young people in exactly the same way as adults. We want to make sure that we're speaking in a language that young people understand. We want to make sure that we're showing young people that we care enough to connect the dots for them. To show them the truth, speak it in their language. It's really what uh, we commonly refer to as contextualizing. Contextualizing, speaking to someone's context. You see that principle in the Bible the whole way through it, don't you? See, for example, Paul in Acts chapter 17, uh, he speaks to the people of Athens. He speaks differently than he would to other groups. He uses and quotes their own poets, using language they understand, quoting people, and using cultural illustrations to hook them, to bring them in. You might think about the, the way that the Bible was written in, in Greek. There were two types of Greek in the Bible times. There was Koine Greek, which was the kind of working class English, the language of the marketplace. And there was Classical Greek, which is the more sophisticated language. Which one was the Bible written in? It was written in Koine Greek. The working class language of the marketplace. Why? Because it wanted it to be accessible. It wanted everyone to be able to understand the truth of the scriptures. 
You think about the principle of 1 Corinthians 14, that whole idea when Paul talks about corporate worship, he says, what is your most important thing you need to keep in mind? Edification. That everyone is edified. And so this idea that everyone's able to understand what is communicated is so, so important. We see that time and time again uh, in Scripture. And so we, as we communicate to the Bible as young people, yes, we need to have those foundations of faithfully exegeting a text, but then we need to go beyond that and try and do the difficult work of connecting it to the lives of young people. And for some of us, that can be a very, very difficult task. I actually think delivering youth talks is harder than delivering normal talks. Because for delivering youth talks, you've got to do all the hard work in the exegesis. You've got to do all the heavy lifting that Andrew's walked us through. And you've also got to do the hard work of trying to apply it to a world which, if you're honest, is altogether different to yours. And the truth is, in that second step, in applying it to their world, we can't be lazy. Because if we're lazy, we'll lose them. Let me give you an example of... Uh, how this can be done in a lazy way, which is commonly done, which is by always by using an application, for example, to Facebook. What's the problem with applying everything to Facebook to a group of young people, 13 year olds, 14 year olds? They don't use Facebook. Uh, Facebook's gone, it's buried, right? Young people don't use Facebook. They've moved on to bigger and better things. Facebook's for old people. If at time and time again we become lazy in our application to connect the dots to young people and we say things like applying it to Facebook, and the truth is we've just not done our homework because we've become lazy. And when we become lazy, we lose them. Add to that the difficulty of the fact that uh, young people today are said to have a shorter attention span than any generation of young people in the history of the world. Okay, It's not a world record that you're proud of. Uh, but some research would say that the attention span of young people today is, guess how much? Eight seconds, okay? I think a goldfish is an attention span of nine <laughs> seconds, okay? Whenever I was at school, uh, whenever the teacher wanted to insult us, she would say, you've got the attention span of a goldfish. This is the first generation of young people where that's actually factually true, okay? We do have a generation of goldfish. Uh, I don't know if I believe that research, but that's what it says. And uh, all these kind of different games and things that are developed know that they have got eight seconds, five to eight seconds to hook you at the start of the video. If you watch YouTube, these addiction engineers which have been developed, you might have heard of them, these are people who are literally employed to employ algorithms and employ all these formulas to make their games and their videos addictive. They will tell you that at the start of any video uh, they've got to wait five to ten seconds to capture your attention. And in those five to ten seconds you're subconsciously making a decision as to whether or not you're going to tune in and listen to the rest of what they've got to say. Uh, remember that whenever you communicate the scriptures to young people. As you stand in those first five to ten seconds, they're subconsciously making a decision in their mind whether or not they're going to listen to what this person's going to say. Don't you hear it when you, you sit and you hear a talk, not just to young people, but in general, when someone opens their talk like this. The book of Philippians was written in 70 AD by the Apostle Paul <laughs> in the Asia, and you go, boring, don't you? But compare that with one that starts, for example, like this. Just think of an example. What if you start your talk saying something like this? Statistically, seven out of eight young people suffer from severe loneliness. I wonder, can you relate to that loneliness in your life? See the difference between those two uh, approaches to starting a talk? One, you've given them just boring context. You've dove, dove in there too soon. But the other one, you identify them a need. And what you've done is after you identify that need, is you're going to then draw them and, and take them on a journey and show them how the Bible addresses that need. It's almost like you're creating this itch. And what you want to do is you want to create this itch which hooks them and you want to hold them and you want to hit them with the scriptures and show them how the Bible, in a sense, scratches the itch which you've created. Because young people, in those first five to ten seconds, are making a subconscious decision whether or not they're going to listen to everything they're going to say. And the truth is, all of us, if we're honest, or we were all kind of victims of this um, reducing attention span, probably in large part of the technology. Um, the media are experts, they know, if you want an illustration of this, uh, look at the news, think about how the news has developed. Who watches the news? It's typically older people, isn't it? Sorry if you're here and you watch the news, it might offend you, but it's typically the old people who watch the news. But even think about how the news has developed in the past 50, 60 years. It used to be one guy sitting in front of a camera with a script, reading it off. Then time develops and time develops and time develops. Now it's two different people. They never speak for any more than 30 seconds. The camera always cuts. It doesn't just cut between them. It'll go to other destinations. You'll have other correspondents speaking from other places. And it's always moving. It's fast paced. It'll install video. It's always moving, 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 moving. Why? Because the media know better than anyone that we have a decreasing 
an increasingly poor attention span. And if they want to hold you, they've got to keep things moving. And so that's exactly what we need to do as we uh, come to think about communicating the scriptures to young people. We've got to put in what we might call triggers. Triggers to keep young people hooked, to keep their attention fixated. Not just young people, but all of us. Uh, the solution is probably not to have eight second sermons, right? That's what we might think. If their attention spans eight seconds, let's have eight second sermons. I don't think that's the answer. But I think you need to weave these little hooks and these little triggers through your talk to keep people engaged. And you know what it's like yourself as you sit in church. Uh, you've maybe felt the, the kind of experience of maybe listening to someone speak and you kind of find yourself zoning out and all of a sudden they start telling a story and you kind of go, oh, I'm tuned in again. You can see it when you stand up the front and you can kind of tell when you're losing people and you might change a slide or play a video or put up a photo and then you see visibly everyone's heads go, oh, I'm just tuned in again. <laughs> we all do that, let's be honest. And so we need to weave our talks with those sort of triggers. Um, what are the triggers? I'm going to give you four that you can use, I think, quite helpfully and effectively with young people. Uh, these are developed really by a guy called Leonard Sweet, who talks really about, he did this about 10 years ago, talking about students, but the principles, I think, cross over quite helpfully today. He says, you need to make your talk epic, okay? That sounds good, doesn't it? Make your talk epic. Um, but it's really an acronym. First thing you need to uh, include is experience. You need to include experience. We are all people who crave experiences, and young people in particular are young people who crave experiences. That's why we would go to a football match as opposed to just watching it on the TV. Why would you go to a football match when you could just see it probably better on TV? Because of the, the match, you kind of absorb some of the atmosphere. It's a better experience. Why would you go to an Ed Sheeran concert? Why would you pay £60 and drive halfway across the country to go and see Ed Sheeran when you can sit at your house for free and hit play, probably better quality, but it's not quite the same experience, or not. And young people create experience, the way we all create experience, and of course, that can be dangerous in some extent. Uh, we want to keep in mind that truth is the thing that transforms, and so we want to channel their experience through the lens of truth. But I think we need to make sure that we're helping young people not just see what the Bible says, but feel and, in a sense, experience what the Bible says. I saw this done really well one time uh, with a guy who uh, showed an interview of a shepherd, okay? He was interviewing a shepherd in Romania and he asked the shepherd a series of questions about his sheep. And you can tell from the interview that the, the shepherd visibly loved his sheep. Like he absolutely loved the sheep. And the guy who was asking the questions asked the shepherd, what would you do if one of the sheep went missing? And the shepherd was almost in tears at the thought of one of his sheep going missing. And what was his teaching point? You can all tell. He was teaching about Jesus as the good shepherd. And now he leaves in 99 to go in search of one who goes missing. And it was a really effective way of communicating almost experientially the truth of the scriptures uh, about how Jesus loves his people. Very, very helpful. All the ways you can do it, uh, bring in props, use videos, any way that you can help young people really uh, grasp experientially uh, the reality of what's happening in the Bible. Get them up to act it out and get people involved. All these things are experience and keep young people hooked and keep us all hooked as we teach uh, the scriptures. Secondly, participation and purpose. Young people today love uh, the feeling of being in participation. They love being involved. It's probably because they're the first generation of young people and the first generation in the history of the world that's seen older people want to be like them, don't they? That's what all the marketers do these days. They try and make you feel young and be young and look young. Uh, and child protection is a big thing and child safety is a big thing. And so this generation of young people feel a little bit privileged. Uh, that everyone wants to be like them, and so they feel this love and desire to be involved, to be in participation. They've all got an opinion on Brexit and Trump, don't they? And uh, there it is, but now that went out to vote, they're laughing because they're, they've got an opinion on Brexit and Trump. And there it is, they did not want to vote for Brexit, but they all went up in a roar whenever it happened, um, whenever it does happen. Uh, they crave participation, so you've got to instill that uh, in your talk. Ask questions, throw out questions, Help them explore the text with you. You're in a sense like the coach at the side of the pitch. You're not on the field. You want them to score the goal. You want to show them how the text addresses their issues. And so walk with them. Ask questions. How does this apply to you in school? How does this apply to you and how you spend your time? How does this apply to you tonight when you get home and no one else is watching? Participation. Involve them in your story. As well as a purpose. Young people today crave purpose. They crave knowing that they're a part of something bigger and greater. They're the first generation who've been really marked by major world events, a global recession in 2008, 
terrorism in the West, which has come more tangibly home than perhaps previous generations in the West have. And so they create purpose. They create a sense of meaning in life. They're generation you start to see their older brothers and sisters and cousins discovering that actually once I get a degree it doesn't necessarily mean that I get a good job. And so they're craving purpose, meaning, drive, and we need to give them that through our, uh, our talks uh, as well. Participation and purpose will be helpful for you as well as you see them get engaged because the truth is um, whenever you speak to anyone at the front they can always look a bit depressed, can't they? And uh, see them getting involved will be an encouragement to you. I was speaking to someone recently, and he's like an agent, he's like a music agent, and he gets singers over here to sing in front of different theatres. And he got this girl over from America, and she was singing in front of a few hundred people or whatever, um, and she came backstage after, and she went over to the music agent, and she was in tears. And she said, I'm so, so sorry, that went awful. And he said, no, he didn't, it was brilliant. But he says, you're in Northern Ireland. And you're used to America where everyone goes, that was unbelievable, that was great, whoa, whoa. In Northern Ireland, everyone sits there like this the whole way through and they look like they want to punch you. But they'll walk out there and go, that was the best night of my life. <laughs> but that's just the way we do it, isn't it? And so participation will encourage you as well. So make your talk epic, include experience, include participation and purpose. Thirdly, this generation of young people are image-driven. They're image-driven. That's why Facebook is no longer the head of the game. Things like Instagram, Snapchat, they're even moving on as well. But image driven is a key characteristic of this generation. Facebook tries to keep up by making videos play automatically and having memes pop up and tagging your friends in funny photos. But they're an image driven generation and so you need to remember that as you communicate. Weave images, weave visuals, use them to your advantage as you go through uh, your talk and as you teach the scripture uh, to uh, your young people. Image driven. And then fourthly, connected. Uh, this generation are, quite ironically, the most disconnected, connected generation in the history of the world. And what I mean by that is they've got great friends in Azerbaijan and China and Japan that they've met online. Um, but they also feel the severe isolation of not actually having authentic relationships. We are the generation who have conquered the world by flying people to the moon, yet we've struggled to cross the street to meet our next door neighbour. That's the generation we live in, isn't it? And so our generation craves real connection authentic connection. It's a generation you crave to be known by name. Earlier on, this guy showed to me earlier on, one, one somebody, he's not in this room, but he walked past me earlier on and I said, hey, he said his name, and he goes, do you know my name? He's wearing a name badge. Like, do you know my name? <laughs> and I went, well, you're wearing a name badge, duh. Uh, but he just actually valued that someone knew his name. But that's a picture of our generation. We crave someone really taking an interest, really knowing us by name, Really remembering that I had a difficult week. Remembering I had an exam coming up. Young people crave connection. And so give them connection in your talk. Be vulnerable when you can. not you know, Share about your own story, your own difficulties. <coughs> your own experiences of hardness in life. Be vulnerable. Use stories. Use your story. Use other people's stories. Use testimonies. All effective means of communicating to young people. Making your talk epic. And uh, keeping young people hooked as you try to share the truth of scripture. All of this, of course, built on the foundation of the hard work of the exegesis that we looked at in session one.